thank uh, Chris and uh, Roberto for the invitation to come here today um, and to give a, a presentation on something that's very dear, I think, to all of our hearts. And this, uh, this is a global challenge and as a global community, I think we all um, can see the potential challenges that we face with regard to food security and our food systems. And I think right at the outset, uh, you know, the question is posed whether we can feed 9 billion people without destroying the planet. And I think if you go back and have a look at our history, and particularly if we start to look at the conceptual idea of the planetary boundaries, three of those planetary boundaries have already been exceeded. Namely, CO2 or carbon in the atmosphere, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, and the loss of biodiversity. Now in each of those three, agriculture has played a very significant part in that. And I think to me as an, as an agriculturalist, this is a big challenge for us, is how do we actually pull back into what I call the safe operating space within these planetary boundaries. And if we can do that, effectively I do think we will be able to feed the 9 billion. So I'm an optimist. I do think we can do it, and I do think we can do it without destroying the planet. But it will take very significant changes. So I'd like to acknowledge my partners here. There were 11 CGIR partners uh, within this program, which is a very large program worth about $55 million a year, and also FAO as a partner. And we're one of the flagship CRPs of the CGIR, and there are 14 other flagship CRPs, but is the only one that is effectively addressing what I would say are the fundamental elements of our food production system, land, water, and functional ecosystems. And right at the start, I'll say without any shame, if we can't get these right, these basic elements of the food system right and function, we will not have a food system into the future. So I look at these as very critical elements in the future of feeding the 9 billion. So the content of my speech today is firstly to, to just go over some of the critical issues. And I'm going to have a very strong focus on the developing world because that's where I spent a very significant portion of my career. So we're talking here about emerging economies and economies that are, are probably way behind where you're sitting here in, in Nebraska with regard to your agricultural production system. I'd like to give you some examples of how we are addressing these issues within the program. Addressing these fundamental issues of sustainability, but more importantly, of improving the productivity of these systems. And then finally, some concluding remarks. So if you look at the critical issues that I think we're facing, particularly from a natural resource perspective, this graph here, which came out earlier this year in January by the World Economic Forum, that was looking at global risks. I think this is a telling example of where we sit today. And for the first time, I think, the economic community is starting to see the importance of natural resources. I've put circles around three elements. First of all, climate change. Climate change is occurring. We cannot avoid that. And our challenge ahead of us is how we effectively adapt and manage climate change. Second there, second circle there, is a water crisis. The water crisis is out there. You just have to go to South Asia and look at the challenges they have, both with regard to water scarcity and quality of water. And the third circle element is biodiversity loss and the collapse of ecosystems. 
So you can quite clearly see three of the most significant challenges are effectively related to resources. The food crisis sits much lower in the risk category. So I think this is the first time I've actually seen this uh, whole aspect of natural resources receiving the kind of attention at the global scale and the implications that that can have for economic growth. So let's look at some of the crises. Ecosystems. 10 million hectares of farmland are lost every year due to ecosystem degradation. 66% of the wetlands are used in Africa as food sources and livelihood requirements. And 48% of them in Asia. That's a phenomenal amount of productivity that is coming out of natural ecosystems. And I would say we need a radical overhaul of our agriculture to create farms that enhance rather than degrade the world's ecosystems. I would put it to you that we can no longer increase the real extent of agricultural land. We have to make do with what we've got today and if anything, we should be moving essentially to a lower amount of land under agriculture. And I think we can do it through intensification. Gender, something that's not spoken about at all, and I think has some terrible statistics. Look at the numbers of women that are actually within the agricultural sector within the developing world. 66%. Largely, they have no voice whatsoever. But they are effectively the food machine in the developing world. Look at the numbers of illiterate women. Women that are unable or given the opportunities to be educated. That statistic is shocking, I think, as a, as a global society. And in our own sphere of work, from a research perspective, there's only about 29% women that are representative in the research arena. So to me, one of the great revolutions or paradigms that we can foresee in the future will be driven by women and how we change the paradigm with regard to gender. Land degradation. 24 billion tons of soil are lost annually. And if you, if you just think about that loss, and if you were to put a value to that, it's phenomenal. And I think that type of statistic is unacceptable as a society. 50% of farmland in Africa suffers from erosion and nutrient depletion. Just the value of nutrient loss in Africa annually is being calculated to be worth $4 billion a year. And then finally, something that's probably dear to my heart, is irrigation. There are 34 million hectares of irrigated area that is lying abandoned due to salinization. That's effectively 10% of the global irrigated area. This is unconscionable that we can tolerate this to occur when we do have the ability to manage water resources correctly and also to rehabilitate these areas. Groundwater. 30% of all water globally is underground. In Africa, this we believe is a significant potential to drive a revolution in agriculture in Africa is 100 times more water underground than there is on the surface. The surface water resources in Africa have only been developed by about 2% of the total resources. There are huge opportunities in Africa. Here's an interesting statistic. In India, a tube well is sunk every six seconds. And I'll show you some statistics that show the disastrous effects that that has had and how we've corrected. Wastewater. We live in an, a, a, a first world country here and we have effectively 
the ability to get rid of our wastes. But if you look at the majority of the world, they don't have the type of sewage systems that we have. For example, if you were to go to Hanoi in Vietnam, they have no primary or secondary sewage treatment plants. All of the water or grey water is actually used to grow crops. Most of the vegetables that you eat in Hanoi are grown on wastewater or grey water. We will com we'll continue as agriculture to compete with other sectors through domestic water supply as well as, as industrial. If, we, if you think about it, agriculture is the biggest consumer of water. We're going to have to change quite radically the way we look at water. And urban waste, particularly water pollution that is generated, is, is, is evident in all of the developing and emerging cities, mega cities that are out there. Just go to Accra, just go to effectively also Bangkok, and you can see the issues associated with pollution in these water systems. Floods and droughts, they'll become more prevalent uh, as we move into an, a, a, a time of uncertainty with regard to climate and climate variability. But if you look at the impacts and implications of floods and droughts, they are massive when you look at livelihoods that are lost and on top of that, the implications of huge losses of investments. So if you just take, for example, in China in 2010, you effectively have to move 230 million people due to floods. Those are massive numbers of people and infrastructure loss that occurs. You've just got to come here to the United States in 2012 and the implications of drought and the impact that that has had on the, the economy of the United States. So I would say floods and droughts will become the norm as we move into a climate in which there is significant variability associated with it. So, the Water, Land and Ecosystem, CRP, is attempting to address these challenges and effectively make good on our promise of potentially feeding 9 billion. And so I'm going to give you an overview, a very brief overview of the program, but more importantly, look at some of the things that we're doing or have been doing. I think the central question for us in this program is how can we ensure sustainable agricultural intensification and productivity increases are accomplished in ways that create and enhance ecosystems' resilience for the poor? So we have a mandate to look at the poorest of the poor and those that are in significant poverty. And I do think we can do it. And so we have a mission and a vision that says that we think a world in which agriculture thrives within vibrant ecosystems, and I stress ecosystems is a centrality of this program, where communities have higher incomes, improve food security, and most importantly, the ability to continuously improve their lives. It's not about just meeting food demand at a household level. It's about moving people up the development ladder. And we see this, that the key drivers of this change will only occur through policy arenas, reformed institutions, and informed investments. That's where you can take essentially the knowledge that we're generating, the science-based knowledge, and actually put it into action and have impact. It is through, not us as a research organization, but through partners who effectively are governments, are development um, uh, practitioners, and also the big investment banks. So we have a very diverse program that effectively is made up of six key flagships. First one on revitalizing degraded agricultural ecosystems, increasing land and water productivity, 
recovering and reusing resources, managing resource variability um, and com competing uses, and strengthening decision-making analysis, being smarter about using data in order to make sound decisions. And then finally, integrating all of these within what we would call integrating ecosystem solutions into policies and investments. But note there are two key overarching components to this program. Firstly, eco-services and resilience. And secondly, gender poverty and institutions. This, in a nutshell, actually represents the program as it stands today. And I think what it does encapsulate is really the fundamental elements that we're trying to address. So if I can now go through some of the areas in which we're working in, all of this is just a short collage of the work that's being undertaken within the program. And I, I'd like to address them under these various flagship banners. And the first one, ecosystem services and resilience. And I'd like to give you an example of where we've been working in Bangladesh in communities that are essentially landless and the poorest of the poor. And that's in the, the Ganges uh, base, uh, Delta. And specifically, we've been looking at where do people get their food? And almost 30% of all Bangladesh's food is coming from fisheries on that floodplain. And these floodplains are really critical for food supply. And, and, the, and the protein component in diets. What we have been doing is building community-based organizations to increase fish productivity within what are these natural wetlands. And we've been able to use different size fingerlings and introduce them into these natural wetlands and increase the productivity of these systems by eightfold. What are the implications for this? If you look at these wetland systems, they are the commons. They are effectively a resource where the poorest and the landless can actually access. And what has happened through these community organizations is essentially to enhance the productivities of these natural systems and essentially result in better food security, protein, and markets. In addition, with these improvements, we've been able to increase the productivity of rice, which is a component in these systems, with much lower inputs. So it's positive benefits to all. Secondly, another example of using wetlands, and this comes from the Mekong, where there has been very significant growth in large infrastructure, and particularly with regard to hydropower development. And what you find in hydropower development is that during the dry season, you have what is termed the drawdown area of the dam or the water structure. And that can be as much as 80% of the water is actually lost from the storage structure during the dry season for hydropower production. That drawdown area offers huge opportunities for changing people's livelihoods. And what we have been doing is building small infrastructure in the drawdown area that results in these development of these artificial wetlands where you can keep fish, there's fish that are kept there. They then become a resource for food, for, for communities, as well as a refuge for spawning during the dry season. So just by putting in simple structures within that drawdown area, you can change the livelihoods dramatically of communities that are around these areas. Gender, and again I draw an example from the Mekong, where again hydropower has huge implications on the impacts on gender within these communities. And to give you an example of this is with hydropower production, and in particular Let's focus on women here. What, what we used to have were functional river gardens in which women would grow vegetables and other uh, commodities that could be sold into the market. Now with the fact that you've got these dramatic fluctuations in river height due to releases, these river, river gardens have actually disappeared 
and you can't effectively grow crops. So what we've had to do is look at how do we restore women's livelihoods um, through resettlement programs that have been undertaken. And what we've found is that through this resettlement program and work, women have greater access today than before to education and effectively other income generating opportunities that have been now made available to them. For example, weaving um, and opening markets for them. So what you see is, is, is in this case, it was a potentially a hopeless situation where you were effectively looking at um, the relocation and settlement of communities and how you have to try and restore back uh, to some form of normalcy their livelihoods. Revitalizing degraded uh, ecosystems and this is some work that we've been doing in Central Asia and this is in the large irrigated systems uh, of Central Asia and in particular focusing on regions uh, within the irrigated area that have been abandoned due to salinization, poor management. We found that the shrub licorice, the roots of which are harvested and can be used for a whole range of uh, pharmaceutical, medicinal and also industrial uses and effectively one of the biggest consumers of licorice extract is the Coca-Cola company, that you can grow licorice in these salinized areas and effectively re restore these degraded systems back into production within three to four years so that you can go back into a, a cotton wheat production system. And the amelioration is largely due to the fact that you've got these deep-rooted perennial um, plants within the system that dewater the profile and allow the leaching of salts to below about 2.3 meters, where effectively you can start to think about growing uh, agronomic crops. And the expansion that has occurred is dramatic. Um, if you look at where we were in 2009 to where we are uh, last year, um, we're looking at an expansion rate of about 4,000 hectares that have already been uh, rehabilitated. And the World Bank is looking at investing uh, in potentially 100,000 hectares uh, as part of a big rehabilitation program uh, in the in the region. And the beauty about licorice is that it does generate incomes uh, for poor farmers, very significant incomes that, that actually are better than what they're getting from cotton and wheat because those are regulated crops. Increasing water productivity and land productivity. Um, I'm going to give you two examples here and they come from South Asia and India and they're quite contrasting in West Bengal, what we have seen over the past probably 10 years is this massive slump in agricultural growth. And the question was why was this occurring? So if you dug a bit deeper into why it was occurring, there were two fundamental problems with the policy arena. First of all, all tube wells had to be licensed. Licensing was a corrupt system where people were getting backhanders and under the table uh, funding. So it was completely corrupt. Secondly, the cost of electrification or connecting to the grid system was astronomical. So what we suggested to the government of West Bengal was change the policy, do away with all licensing of tube wells, and why? We're sitting in a rainfall regime of about 1,250 to 1,500 millimeters. There is ample enough incoming rainfall to effectively recharge aquifers. And secondly, to have a flat connection rate with respect to electricity. They've implemented this and it's had a huge impact on the number of tube wells and pumps that have been bought over the past three years. And we predict 
that there will be very significant increases in rice production over the next three to four years. So just by influencing the policy arena, you've got this massive behavioral change that has occurred with now an increase in productivity growth. The second one is the groundwater nexus that I'm sure you're well aware of within India, and particularly Western India. If you look at this map here, you can see the intensity of overexploitation. The red clearly shows that in the West, states such as Rajasthan and Gujarat have extremely stressed aquifers. What I'd also like to point out is if you go into the eastern Indo-Gangetic plain, you see very little groundwater extraction. And we'll come on to that in a moment. But Mr. Modi, the new Prime Minister of India, came to Emi and said, I have a problem. My utility companies are going bankrupt. Why? Because we're supplying electricity free to rural communities. So what happened is essentially you're supplying electricity to these rural villages and agriculture and they were taking great advantage of that by pumping 24 hours a day. Farmers were just exploiting the groundwater. So the logical argument would be you need to start to price electricity at a, at a, at a price where you actually do get reform. Mr. Modi said he can't do that. Why? Because he would be out of government at the next election. So what we came up with was a pragmatic solution. And the pra pragmatic solution meant dividing the electricity supply line into two. 24-hour supply line to villages and a rationing of supply between six and eight hours to effectively the rural fields where pumping was occurring for agriculture. This had a dramatic impact in that you got this huge behavioral change amongst farmers where they could no longer pump 24 hours a day. They start to look at being far more conservative in the way they use their water. And this map tells the bottom line. If you look at the figure on, on your right, it's a lot more bluer than the figure on your left. And that indicates effectively the groundwater rise that is occurring in aquifers in Gujarat. Not only have we reduced the amount of pumping that is occurring in the agricultural sector, but we've also started to see significant increases in recharge occurring within these aquifers. So again, a policy uh, arena being a, a influential. That same policy is now being rolled out by the Indian government in other states, such as Rajasthan and also in Andhra Pradesh, where there are very stressed aquifers. The cost of rewiring the electricity supply was $500 million that the Gujarat government invested. And it's been a, a fantastic outcome. I'd like to now re revert to recovering and reusing resources. We are the only, you could say, CRP within the CGIR that is looking at urbanization, and particularly peri -urban. This is effectively I'd say the elephant in the room. We are having massive movements, democratic cha demographic changes occurring in all of the developing world with people moving to larger cities. This has huge implications. And we think there are opportunities here and, and particularly looking at resources that are being generated. And here we've specific, specifically been looking at business models. We know the technology about how we can convert wastes into products. But more importantly, we see the actual opportunity is to convert these into businesses, enterprises where people are making money. So we've been working with uh, our partners for, for now, probably 10 years, 
And we now are producing products that can be used and marketed. Um, and we're now setting up these small businesses. Um, and in, in, an excellent example of this is in Accra, where we are actually building a, a business worth about $4 million that will effectively cater for specific components of the waste cycle. And that component is septage, uh, human septage. And we're working again with FAO, World Health Organization and UNEP, particularly looking at how do we safely dispose of these wastes. So the kind of things that we've been doing is taking septage, as you see, um, and converting it into composts or to fertilizers um, that are safe, that are highly uh, functional, and we have effectively a trademark on a, a product that we call Fortify, uh, which is now going into production um, and, and being sold as a commercial entity. So the whole, the whole idea is really looking at how we can convert wastes, solid wastes, um, as well as liquid wastes, into uh, opportunities. And that goes from fertilizer production right through to producing briquettes that can be used in energy. And the other aspect of that is water, grey water. And we can safe, safely use this. And if you start to think of a water energy nexus, this is a fantastic example of how you can actually bridge that water food energy nexus. If you look at the cost of treating sewage discharge, it's way beyond the resources of most large developing cities. They can't do it. And if you were to put in the same type of reticulation system that you have here, say in Lincoln, there's not enough water globally to go around to do that. So you have to be looking at how do I use these waters, any waters that are being um, produced uh, uh, in a more efficient way. And here we're looking at it, at using these as irrigation waters. And there are fantastic examples um, from India as well. In Hyderabad, Hyderabad has no primary treatment. All the discharge goes into the Musi River. But by having anacuts that are taking off water from the Musi, as it moves downstream, and growing crops of rice, paragraphs that are fed to, to buffalo, you effectively clean these waters up because these are essentially wetland systems. And by 40 kilometers south of Hyderabad, the water has returned to effectively a potable level. So using natural infrastructure to, to actually harvest the key components of, uh, you could say, wastewater has huge implications on food security, again for many poor people. Um, managing resource variability, and we, we, we're looking at this in, in several ways, and uh, we're working in Latin America in, in looking at benefit sharing mechanisms uh, and also payment for environmental services. And we've been very successful in implementing pilots in Peru and in Colombia, where we're looking at payments for environmental services and benefit sharing mechanisms. And these are now going into law in Peru. We actually influenced the, uh, the policy arena with regard to generating these uh, programs. And effectively, this has been rolled out uh, in about 30 other locations within the Andes. So, so here we're seeing a greater amount of equity distribution being uh, addressed within these, these, these river basin catchments. The other one that I wanted to, to uh, uh, put forward that we've been working on, and this comes predominantly from Southeast Asia in the Chao Prae Basin. If you go back to 2010, uh, and I'm sure you, you may have seen vivid pictures of Bangkok, which was underwater, that cost billions of dollars because Bangkok was underwater for over two months. Um, had huge implications on, on the industrial base. And the reason for that was you had these huge volumes of water moving down the child prayer due to, again, this climate variability. What we've been doing is saying, 
there's an opportunity to take that flood water that's in the upper portion of the child prayer basin and actually spread it across rice fields during the wet season in years in which there is this abnormal intense storms. Use the rice paddy systems up in the, the northern portion of the basin to actually become effectively floodplain mitigation and recharge systems and then in the dry season effectively to pump those systems and grow rice in the dry season. So you create storage capacity in the aquifer during the dry season in order to take that excess rainfall in the wet season. The Thai government are seriously looking at this as a potential means of natural infrastructure to address some of the flooding issues that will become more and more prevalent. Another example of this is the Indo-Gangetic Plain, particularly the Eastern Indo-Gangetic Plain, and we call this the GAMES, the Ganges Aquifer Management for Ecosystem Services. If you look at, at that uh, the diagram of India that I showed you, if you look at the eastern Indo-Gangetic Plain, there is virtually no groundwater abstraction. Yet the region has huge amounts of groundwater reserves. And the question is, why is this? The problem is energy. You need energy effectively to take out that water. But also there's an opportunity that if you were to create storage capacity in these aquifers, you can take some of the monsoon flooding that occurs in the lower basin of uh, the Ganges and put it underground to be pumped again in the dry season. So effectively you have the potential to produce crops 365 days of the year. At the moment, they struggle with producing a single crop a year. And that's why you've got 500 million people that are destitute in poverty. So we're doing a, a massive feasibility study to look at how potentially you could put this Ganges water machine into action. It will cost billions of dollars of investment, but we think it is a way in which you can effectively lift this massive population out of poverty by allowing them to access water. And that accessing water will effectively depend on energy. And as we move into an era where solar power pumps are becoming very cheap, inexpensive, particularly Chinese, this offers huge opportunities for individualistic irrigation and water resources management. And finally, um, uh, no, not finally, uh, second to last, is, is to actually show what we've been doing by integration. And this again comes from Bangladesh and the Polder Systems is to look at some of the big challenges there is, is essentially poor water management. And that poor water management is associated with the polder system. And what we've been able to do is effectively miniaturize the polder system. By miniaturizing, you then start to create these communities, villages, where they can manage their water resources individually. What does that mean? It means it gives them a whole lot of other alternatives that they can actually start to address their livelihoods. So by moving towards miniaturization of the polders, farmers are now able to grow shrimp, they're able to grow fish, they're able to grow rice, and it has increased the productivity of these systems from about three to six tons per hectare to about 11 to 19 tons. That's a massive, phenomenal increase in productivity. And it, it's associated with better water management at the end of the day, that has created effectively all of these other opportunities that people can explore. And this is now being rolled out on a much bigger scale by development practitioners and partners within Bangladesh. And finally, I'd like to just uh, comment on, on decision and decision making analysis. One of the biggest challenges we have in the policy arena in, in the developing world is the lack of information or what information that you do have, is it of any value? And so we have a, a component in our, our program where we start to look at the value of information. What are the 
critical pieces of information that you do need to make sound policy decisions. And we've been helping, for example, in Kenya, the Murti Aquifer that was found last year, is helping the government to make decisions on the viability of accessing that aquifer and then transporting water by pipeline uh, from the aquifer to Nairobi. And again, this is, this is really quite innovative, the kind of uh, approaches that have been taken. But again, it's, it's utilizing information that you have in what are very often very data and information scarce arenas. So, my concluding remarks. Yes, as I started right at the beginning to say that, yes, we can feed 9 billion people. However, these are caveats and several caveats. I believe the key will be how we manage our natural resources. Because our entire food system depends upon it. If we cannot get that right, we don't have a food system. There are no magic bullets or quick fixes. And what you've seen me present are just a small collage of what can work under certain contextual situations. None of what I've presented is a silver bullet at all. They are part of a solution. Our current production systems and approaches to food production need radical change. If we want to place them on a sustainability footing. And this, I think, is the paradigm shift. Is what will be this new agricultural production system or food system that will emerge over the next two decades. To achieve this will require greater perseverance, very hard decisions, and at the end of the day, political will. And I think if we can't achieve that, we won't have a sustainable food system. There will be some very tough decisions to be made in the future. And finally, I'd like to say that really the changes that we're wanting to see in our food production systems will be driven by people. The key will be people. It's you and I and everyone else. It will require very significant behavioral change. And if you think about it, our consumptive patterns globally are just not sustainable. So all of us in the room here will have to change quite radically if we are going to feed the 9 billion, but more importantly, to be more equitable at the end of the day. So I'd like to thank you for the time, and I would encourage you to please visit our website, our blog, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.